questions in the Beatitudes, Matthew, uh, Matthew 5, 6, 7, or last few Thursdays, and we looked at Jesus' what's and uh, why's, and uh, we're looking at Jesus' who's today, as in who. For example, knock, knock. Deja vu. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Hike. Didn't know you like Japanese poetry. Let's leave it there. We've got plenty more. Keep, keep going. Who? Who? Of course, that is really asking what or which person, isn't it? Who? And now Jesus is asking that. Remember we told, talked about questions, that when Jesus asks the question, it's not because he doesn't know, and it's not for his benefit, it's for our benefit to, to, to find out where we are, what we know, who we're trusting in. And of course, the questioner reveals his heart then, doesn't he? Remember we saw Satan revealed his heart straight away, the first question of the Bible, did God say? Did God really say? We see straight away where is his nature, and that's why we love Genesis, because where we get Genesis, we get the foundational teaching of character, of everything we, we, we think socially and sexually and all those kind of things. Genesis is the root of it. We get that right, and we have great foundation right up. And uh, so we go to Jesus. Jesus asking who? Well, we looked at this question uh, a few weeks ago, and Jesus is... Uh, He's with his disciples, young men, and of course, he's, he's mentoring them, if you like that new word we, we have these days. Mentoring, why? Because when he goes, the, 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 the future of the church, just imagine that, are in these young men's hands. Fancy that. Uh, why God has done it this way, I don't know. Because left to me and you, remember, now we are the church, and um, dear me, you think, why would he trust me and you with this wonderful work of, of knowing the gospel and sharing the God? We are ambassadors. We are people that bring the message of reconciliation. The Bible says he's entrusted it to me and you. Amazing. So, you know, he, he's, he's got him around. He said, now, boys, he said, I know you've got your ear to the, to the floor. Who do people say that I am? Well, it's a good question. John the Baptist, because remember John the Baptist was beheaded. You must have come back, must have come back to life, and because he was a great, oh, a mighty man. And now one of the prophets, Elijah, Jeremiah, the great prophets, they esteemed. And Jesus said, "That's very interesting, what people think I am, or who they say I am." But let's get down to the nitty gritty, boys. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And you see, that question is so paramount and foundational, and crucial to your salvation and to your walk with the Lord. See, if he's a Jesus that is just meets your need, or is someone you turn to in difficulty, then you've got a wrong idea who Jesus is. Because Jesus wants to be right in the middle of our lives. In fact, he wants to be the director of our lives. In fact, he tells us, unless you deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, don't even start the discipleship road. Oh, dear, that's a bit strong. Well, I'm only just telling you what Jesus says. Jesus says this. Who do you see him? And you see him, when we recognize who he is, what a one. And now Peter comes, and we love Peter because... Uh, he just blurts, you are, you are Christ, the Son, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, he said. And uh, Jesus said, Peter, that wasn't your idea. Holy Spirit revealed that to you. Revealed that to you. And you see, that's a, it, there is that revelationary part that Jesus is revealed to us who he is. Who he is. We read uh, that quote from um, C.S. Lewis. <clears throat> who said, please, um, and of course he was a, quite a, quite a uh, well-spoken Englishman, um, please don't give me any of that patronizing nonsense of calling Jesus a good teacher. He said he's not given us that option. He is either who he says he is, the Lord of glory, the King of kings, God, the God-man, or he is, as he says, a liar or a lunatic. 
She said, don't give me any of that and the other nonsense. We, why? Because Jesus is given every title, every characteristic that is given and appropriated and given to, G, to God himself. And you don't have to look too far. He is called uh, the Redeemer. He's called the Savior. He's called the Rock. He's called the Redeemer, our righteousness, the Shepherd, the Creator, the Giver of life, Alpha and Omega, the Forgiver of sin, the Healer. All, he receives worship. He receives prayer. He forgives sin. Now, the Pharisees knew, and, and thankfully, the, the Bible gives us the Pharisees to highlight what Jesus is saying. Uh, uh, he always used to say, Chuck, he said, when the Pharisees say something, hold air now, because that's a flag for you to see what God is trying to say. And the Pharisees said, who can forgive sin? Only God alone. Absolutely true. That, that was a true statement, because Jesus knew it was true, because he said, I forgive you. So in that moment, who is he claiming to be? No one else can forgive you. You can go and confess to someone, and that's nothing, you know, in a sense, it's good to confess our, our sin. It depends who we confess it to, man, be careful. But just because they give you absolution doesn't make a blind bit of difference. The only one who can give you absolution is Jesus himself, who purchased your salvation. Who is Jesus? Well, of course, remember now the Pharisees again. To highlight, Jesus was there, John's gospel especially. And in John 8, he's beginning to tell, and he, he's, he's saying those I ams. Now, every time he says I am, we understand. Now, we just read it, I am. But when you understand a Jewish uh, thinking, he's saying that he is God. Because in Exodus 3, this is the eternal name. God says, now, this is the name I want to be remembered. This is my eternal name. What, what's that name? I am. So when Jesus begins to say, I am, at the beginning of John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. I am. I, and he, he's, he's explained to them all. And then the Pharisees come along and says, who are you? Who are you? And Jesus is saying, I've told you clearly who I am. And then towards the end of that chapter, he talks about uh, Abraham looked at this day and Abraham knew that I was coming and Abraham looked forward to this day and then they said, well, you're only you're not even 50 yet and how do you know Abraham? And this is the absolutely crucial statement. See, this distinguishes, and uh, see, how we, how we find and, and know if something is, a, is real or what we say a cult, something that is uh, not real Christianity is who you think Jesus is. Don't have to go over any further who you think Jesus is. And what he says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying. That's why they tried to kill him. That's why they tried to stone him then and there because he who was a man claimed to be God. Who do you say that I am? You see, if he is Jesus, the God-man, then dear me, he is to be worshipped, to be listened to, to give, to be have faith in, to be committed to, <laughs> to give our lives to. Why not? It makes no other sense if he is who he says he is. Father, help us to realize who he is. A lot of Jesus of our own making, because we can do that. The Bible he says in, in, in Corinthians, be careful when they come and preach to you another Jesus. And we've got plenty of Jesuses, even in churches today. Another Jesus. Another Jesus who actually says, Dave, you're great. You're fantastic. Yeah, well, that's okay. You don't worry about changing that. Don't worry about living like that. You're wonderful. You're marvelous. Now, let me tell you, there's no one loves you like Jesus. And, uh, but he will tell you clearly. A good parent tells you when you're wrong, don't they? Even when we don't like it. Oh, no. Why? Because why they want you to be the best you can be and to correct character flaws. So who do, who do you say that I am tonight? Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Is he your Redeemer? Is he the one you run to straight away? Is he the one you turn to first and foremost before anybody and anyone else? Ah, that's a good question. Because if he is who he says he is, he's the only one to run to, isn't he? Bless the Lord. Jesus was um, beginning to work his miracles. 
Um, he had um, just uh, healed all those people. Uh, he'd healed his mother-in-law. Uh, he healed Peter's mother-in-law, which showed Peter would love more than anyone else, as we said before. Uh, he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and, and he was healing and everyone else. And then he, he, he raised the, uh, the, the, uh, in Nain, the widow of Nain, he raised the, the son. And, and then he's, 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 the crowd is all around him because, you know, remember, there's no TV then, and they just wanted to see a miracle. And Jesus was beginning to, the momentum of his fame was running. And then Jairus comes along, this synagogue ruler, remember, synagogue ruler? He's putting his, his career at stake here. But you know what? His little girl... 12 years of age, was dying. And he said, Jesus, come and just come and touch her. Come and put your hands on her. Come and heal her. See, that, that need, remember we said, God brings great needs across our path, not for need's sake, but to get us to come to Jesus. Remember, our need is not the greatest problem or the greatest need in our life. Our greatest need is Jesus. So as we said before, Hannah, when she was barren, she thought her greatest need was a, a baby. But God said, no, he used that greatest need to get her into his presence so she would know him. So then he would be the most important thing. That's why she sang the song, there's none as holy as you. There's none beside you. Jacob, as we said on Thursday, his greatest need, he thought, was, Lord, protect me from Esau. Esau's coming. He's big and strong. You've got 400 men. I'm in trouble. But that was God using that need to get it. Jacob into his presence so Jacob would know the Lord. He forgot about Esau. He wanted the blessing of God, and God changed his name and nature. See, God will bring all those needs across. Why? Great needs we have, but he just wants time with us. He wants us to be in his presence so we will know him more than anyone else. He will be our greatest desire. And so we have Jairus, and of course, he, he's, he's, he's a bit concerned because she's ill, and she's not dead yet, and, and he's trying to sort of, you can see in his mind, he, he, uh, when we are impatient, some of us, aren't we? Um, I don't know if you go shopping, you know, I'm always trying to pick the shortest queue, you know, I'm looking, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing who's the quickest person on the till, because you never, you know, and then you got, you're looking who's going through the till, because if they're a bit mature, you know they're going to be forever getting their money out, and, uh, and you're thinking, who's the quick, and you're, you're impatient, and you know, you're always getting the wrong one, don't you? You're always getting one, and someone, and then she goes, aisle five, can you give me the price on this? And you think, oh, I picked the wrong one. It's like on the motorway, when you've got a queue, and you, you think, well, that one's going quick, and you jump in that queue, and then you, that car's gone by me again. We're impatient, and you can see Jairus, this is great impatient, because he, his, his daughter's ill. And um, in the meantime, there's a woman. She's got an issue. The issue is blood. Um, Twelve years. Um, and of course, because she's got this issue, serious issue, she was getting worse and worse. She was broke. She spent all her money on doctors. But, but this issue of blood meant she was separated socially, spiritually, um, Lonely, burdened, hopeless, helpless, and uh, nothing left in her life. Isn't that what issues do to us? See, as I said last week, many of us are walking around in adult bodies, but we are still carrying issues of little children. But we're carrying issues. I was going to show a, 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 t a testimony about a forgiveness. So powerful forgiveness. We talked uh, many times about our emotional state that can affect our physical health. Why? Because we try part it. We know that. We understand that. Fear, hate, all those things affect our physical bodies. And that's why the Bible says forgive. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Give it to me. Give it to me. As I forgive you, you forgive those. And um, when, we, when we deny, remember what we said, when we, although emotions come, we don't deny them. Neither we do, do we let them dictate. We deal with them. Just reading Sarah News this week. So often we repress or suppress bad idea. He said, confess. Get into the Lord's presence. See, those things that rise up in our hearts, um, they may be issues that we never dealt with. They may be just the way we're feeling in that day. Either way, get before the Lord, he says. Take them to the Lord. Let him deal with them. Don't dwell on them. God, don't we dwell on them? Oh, I'm not feeling too good today. And then we love a pity party because we want people to ask us, how are you feeling? And then, uh, let me tell you, if you're always mourning, there'll never be many people asking how you are. 
And, the, and there are people I say, I think, how long have I got you now? Before I ask them how they are, isn't it? Because you could be there a long time. Um, she had some great issues. But the Bible said she was going to press through. She pressed through. Remember, this was dangerous. This was a criminal offense. Because everyone she touched would be unclean. And to touch Jesus would be a greater uh, uh, you know, crime in a sense. And uh, she pushed through. And the Bible says, she said in her heart, if I but touch him. The word touch doesn't mean touch. It means to grab a hold of, to attach myself, to entwine myself onto him. She was looking for more healing, you see. Because she was looking for wholeness. Salvation, the word is. Really, the word there. I, I want to be healed. But she wanted to be saved. Bless the Lord. She saw more than an issue. She saw Jesus, who he was. And she went forward and touched the hem of his garment. Now, we know the hem of a garment don't mean anything to us today. But the hem of a garment, certainly in the Eastern um, uh, society, uh, meant a person's status or social standing. The hem of a garment. Also, Jews, remember, Numbers 15, on the hem of the garments, you have tassels, the blue cord, heavenly, to remind them of God's commands, God's word. And we know it, it, it's, it's, it's important because remember, remember David, he, didn't, he had the opportunity to kill Saul, didn't he? But the Bible says he cut off the edge of his cloak. He cut the, that hem. Uh, and that was an attack on, on the person of Saul, really. And the Bible says he felt so guilty. So guilty. And he said, Saul, I'm so sorry. He didn't believe. You see, that's why the Bible says David was a man after my own heart. He was, he was, a, he was a man that um, repented quickly, saw his faults quickly, and, and made sure they were dealt quickly. Not always with Bathsheba, but when he did, he, oh, he was really repentant. And uh, he said, I'm so sorry. I should not have done that. Why? Because that was an attack on the person of Saul. So when she reached out to touch the hem of his garment, she was actually touching who he was and the word. Because remember, the tassels describe the word. Also, I've read this in the um, Hebrew Bible. Very interesting that the border also could be translated wings, as it, it does many times. And, uh, of course, some superstition is involved, but not this particular verse where it says... Uh, from Malachi, the Messiah will rise with healing in his wings. So they attribute, they can attribute that to, to the wings on, on, the, on the edge of it. And so she, by faith, was touching Jesus, pressed through. Now, the Bible says immediately she knew she'd been relieved from the word there's plague, her affliction, that thing that really bore down on her, plagued her. Bless the Lord. Touch Jesus. Touch the hem of his garment. What's plaguing you today? What issues? What difficulty? What habits are still plaguing you after all these years? Touch the hem of his garment by faith tonight. Now, she was just going to drift away because it was a big crowd. When it's a big crowd, you can be, you know, I was, I was reading last week and people were, we went to um, Billy Graham and, and people said, oh, I was wonderful. And I thought, well, I didn't even see you there. And lots of people I knew, I didn't, I didn't see him. In a crowd, you can get easily lost. And, you know, but Jesus stopped. Who touched me? Who touched me? Why would Jesus bring this woman to the attention of the crowd? Why would he do that? Was it to embarrass her or to expose her? Would Jesus do that? No. But for her to openly confess... For Jesus to make sure that she knew she was not just healed, but be made whole, he said, who touched me? And uh, the Bible says everyone's denying it. No, no one touched you. Everyone's, it's so, and the disciples say, what are you talking about, Jesus? There's so many of this. Who knows? There's people are bumping into you all the time. No, no, someone's touched me. I knew the power of the Lord has gone out from me. The power is gone. Who's touched me? And the Bible says, there she is, cowering in fear and trembling expecting maybe the worst. Jesus speaks into her heart. Daughter. He never speaks to anyone like that in the whole of the Gospels. That's the only person he calls daughter. 
See, in that moment where he says, I want you to come and confess me outwardly, he wanted to make sure that she knew what she'd received. Not just healing, but salvation. Intimacy with the Lord. Now she was a daughter. What a wonderful... To be called a daughter by the King of Kings. Daughter, your faith has been made, made you whole. Go in peace, the peace of God. Be of great courage. Bless the Lord. She, God wanted to make sure, out of that confession, he wanted to make sure that she knew. And the people knew that anyone who reached out to him in faith would not just be made, it would be healed, but be made whole. It's a big difference. Ten lepers were healed. Only one was made whole. Because he recognized who Jesus was and came back and gave thanks. Oh, tonight, who oh, touched me? Who oh, touched me? Stretch out, reach out to Jesus. Touch the hem of his garment. Touch who he is. Touch the word. He is the word. Oh, bless the Lord. Now, Jesus was teaching, and it's amazing that um, however, however famous someone can be, however uh, popular and however brilliant someone can be, they're always someone's brother or someone's son, isn't they? However old we are, we're always our mother's sons, aren't we? And our children are always our sons and daughters. Doesn't matter how, how, you know, how, how famous they can be. And uh, Jesus was really, the, everything was going amazingly. The, the Bible says people were thronging around. The miracles were going to happen. In Matthew 12, the Bible says he was teaching and, uh, in a house by the sound of a sitting in a place. His mum and brothers couldn't get in. And uh, they say, oh, your mother and brothers are outside. And the, the, the sort of inclination is they try, they, they say, they're trying to bring him back home and say, what do you think you're doing? You, who do you think you are? Of course, only our family can tell us that, because they've seen us from there. They knew us when we weren't anybody. Who do you think you are? And we love Jesus. Who? Who is my mother? Who is my brother? And they were thinking, I don't know. They're, they're outside. And he looked at the crowd. He said, you, you, anyone who does the will of of my father is my brother and my mother and my sister and my sister. Oh, Father, what a wonderful, wonderful. See, that's amazing, really, isn't it? Jesus said, and of course, that's the key. Whoever does the will of my father. See, that's the bottom line for salvation, really. It isn't you know, it's something we say, well, I believe, I believe. There is a will change. There's a will change. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. See, that's the, the essence of the heart of conversion. 1 John 2 says this, do not love the world, anything in the world, the love of this world, love of uh, possessions, materialism, love of um, what you, you can gratify yourself, uh, hedonism, Pride, obsession with yourself, your status, egotism. This world and these desires pass away. But those who do the will of the Lord will live forever. You see, what it is, there's a will change. Many people have a, a, a belief change, but never have a will change. See, the, that's why the Bible says repent and believe. Repentance is a change of direction. From me, I, and my self-centeredness to God-centeredness. What does God think? What do you think? What do you say in all these areas, Lord? What do you think in every particular area of my life? That's why we pray. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Hebrews says, Lord, equip us. He's the shepherd. Equip us to do every good thing to do your will. See, our will is gone. If you want to be a Christian, a disciple of God, your will is gone. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. You want to be a, 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 in the family of the living God? Yes. Do the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? Well, he tells us, I just will the Father to be saved, of course. Uh, will that none should perish, all should come to salvation. Sa sanctified to be holy. This is the will of God that you'll be sanctified. That's his and his alone. 
You'll be wise, wise decisions, time by eternity, time, talents, tithes. The will of God is for you to serve him. It's the will of God to you to serve him. He saved you to serve him. Not just save you to get to heaven. Bless the Lord. He saved you to come right into the center of your life and your heart. Who is my brother's? That's why we looked at the why question the other day. He said, why, why do you call me Lord and then not do what I say? Then not do what I say. Thankfully, the Bible says when we are children of God, bless the Lord. That alone is amazing. As we just heard that woman say, daughter, children of God, our identity is changed. Then that leads to our intimacy change because we now have intimacy with God Almighty, his Father. And of course, that, as we've looked at the other day, our inheritance has changed. Bless the Lord. I've got a Father on the throne of the universe. Why am I worried? Why am I fearful? Why am I concerned? That's because I allow those things to happen. He says, look up. See who your Father is. Didn't it? What we used to say, who's your Father? No, if you're going to trouble, who's your father? And that was it. If no, uh, someone else, don't tell my father, I'd be in big trouble. Uh, who's your father? Isn't that amazing? Who's your father? Bless the Lord. Who is my mother and my brothers? And the last who in, uh, from Jesus. Jesus is talking about being, in Matthew 24, being ready and watching and uh, alert um, for lots of things, but ultimately... Um, for uh, his return and what's happening in our world, be alert. And then he says, who is the faithful and wise servant? Matthew 24, 44, 44, 45. Who is the faithful and wise servant? Who is? Who is the faithful and wise? Who is those? Those that are ready, those who are listening, those who are watching, those who are following those who are serving. That's the faithful and wise servant. He goes on after those lazy ones who just take their eyes off what's going on and just look at this planet, look at the things going on. They say they take it easy, then they, they are lazy, and then their conduct goes awry because then they're beating and they, they are drinking with the drunkards and all that kind of thing. He says there, he says, be alert. Who is the wise and faithful servant? Watchful, watchful, and alert. Isn't it amazing um, that God calls me and you? God has called us into his kingdom. God has called us into his family. But he's also called us into his service. His service. He wants you to serve him. Bless the Lord. Don't think uh, this is me up here. Look, unless you tell the people of, uh, the, around you, if you wait for me to tell them, I now meet them. See, we are everybody reaching, serving, loving, showing you who is the faithful and wise servant. He who does what I've called him to do. He who's living out his calling. Dave, how do I find out my calling? First of all, your first calling is to know Jesus, is to be intimate with him. I found them closer you get to the Lord, those things crop up that we see to do. So often we're looking for things to do and we've neglected the most important thing is to be in relationship with him, to know him and forsaking all others. I was just thinking, you know, in amazing where I was just uh, thinking when I stood a long time ago, 30 years now, and I stood here and, and uh, give those vows. I was just reading them this afternoon and we say, forsaking all others, I serve you. Oh, well, I, I have been serving her for 30 years, yeah. Um, she's not there, so okay. Um, I, I give myself to you. Isn't it amazing? If, if I'd said, well, Jackie, wait a minute now. He said, that's, that's amazing, amazing uh, promise to make, isn't it? Forsaking all others for you forever. Let me, let's make a deal. Let me be faithful, forsaking all others 99% of the time. That's a good offer, Jack, isn't it? What do you think she would say? Well, you know what? Why do we do the same with Jesus? 
forsaking all others, faithful to him. All that he wants in our life. Everything we, he, he desires. Yet we are, we think we can make a deal with God. Lord, let me just be 90% 90, 90 forsaking others. But that 1% to me, you know, in, in natural life, as we just said, how absurd. Yet we can do it with the king of glory. Who is Jesus? That's where it starts. Who touched me? Bless. We need something from the Lord tonight. Touch him tonight. Reach out. Who is my family? Anyone who follows me, listens, does my will. And we want to be faithful and wise servants, don't we? Faithfulness is a great characteristic that is so lost in our, in our world today, in our society. Faithfulness. In every, in every form, isn't it? it? Even going down to the, the insignificant things like clubs and social events. People, all those are fading away because people, you can all know faithfulness to a particular, you know, social club. And then we can go on to marriage and goodness knows what. Faithfulness, and God desires that more than anything else. When God commends us, that's one of the commendations you were in. Well done, good and faithful servant. Hey, let's pray. Thank you, Father. What a great God you are. You love us. You love us too much for us to, to stay where we have one life to live. How short it is. Lord, we don't want to waste it. We don't want to waste it on things that when we look into eternity, we look back. A waste of time. Father, we want to know you. We want to love you. We want to be faithful and wise servants. We want to do your will in our lives. We want to be wholly yours. Why would we not want to be wholly yours when we realize who you are and what you've done? That you went to the cross for us. That's why you tell us to keep looking to the cross. Keep looking to you. Lord, we will not become weary and give up. Lord, we pray. Bless us tonight. If we don't know you, Lord, we pray. We will invite you in, confessing our sin. Lord, repenting and asking you in. For us who need something tonight, Lord, we will reach out to you, touching the hem of your garment, touching who you are by faith. Lord, receiving from you tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing that lovely hymn.